question is, again, it's a practical question, but how can I, as a Christian, pray more effectively? Now, I added the part as a Christian because I want to always make it very clear on this broadcast that prayer is a spiritual blessing. We said that earlier, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, all spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So prayer is a gift and a privilege, a blessing to those who are already in Christ Jesus and not those who are outside of Christ Jesus. So if you want to be one who can pray effectively, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, am I in Christ Jesus? Mm. And if I'm not in Christ Jesus, Christian, what is the passage that would tell us how to get into Christ Jesus? Well, I think about uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, talking okay. about baptism, right? Okay. It's the past tense. Paul is writing to the Galatians, like, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So we know that baptism is that way to get into Christ Jesus. And you're correct. The text says that. But just real quick question here to clear up the minds of our viewers. Would there be any other way in the New Testament that you've ever read that tells us how to get into Christ Jesus? I mean, is this the only way or is this just one way? I mean, I, I, I don't see any other way to get into Christ Jesus. I mean, I know there's ways to, you know, that prerequisite the baptism, but that's not getting into Christ Jesus. Right. It's just the baptism. So the only way to get into Christ Jesus is being baptized into Christ. So if you're a viewer out there this evening and that statement kind of catches you off guard, and it may, because there's a lot of people in the world that believe faith only. Right. So if we have stated something that's caused you to think, that's okay. Bear with us. Write this down in your mind, your notes, and go home or at your house, I guess, study it more fervently. Amen. But the Bible teaches the only way to get into Christ Jesus is to be baptized. Now, in Christ Jesus, all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 3. Prayer is a spiritual blessing. So the first point, if you want to pray effectively, you've got to be in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, once someone's in Christ, in the church, in the body, how is it that they can strengthen their prayer life? There's a lot of viewers that are listening that are already members of the churches of Christ. What can they do, Christian, to pray more effectively? Well, I think about it starts with humility. It starts with a humble heart. I think about James chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And so it starts with a humble heart. It starts with an honest heart. Um, you know, the, the heart, and when we talk about the heart, we talk about up here, as always. And you know, we want to make sure our hearts are prepared to really, you know, be able to ask God for what we need, but also okay. be prepared to, you know, for whatever life throws at us, we need to make sure our prayer life is, you know, structured and uh, we, we have our, our hearts are behind what we pray for. And, and prayers, you know, I get that we can say some quick prayers sometimes, but our prayers also need to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. they, they need to have not necessarily just a lot of emotion, but a lot of uh, just some zeal behind it because we want to better ourselves 
walking in the faith. And so one of the most practical things you can do to strengthen your prayers is to go back, especially in the Old Testament, and read the prayers of David. Read the prayers of the men in the New Testament, like the Apostle Paul, Christ himself. Read at length and meditate upon their prayers. And if we can learn to pray like them, someone says, well, you don't really learn how to pray. Oh, yes, you do. Because the Bible talks about the fact that we were to learn, correct? Amen. Learn. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples. Praying is something that's not merely natural. It's something that you learn how to do. Now, this teaching, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Prayer should be something that is maintained continually. It's not something I go to casually or occasionally. Prayer is an embedded portion of my life. It is part of who I am. And folks, think of it like this. If we have two pipelines, we have two pipelines. The only way, this one represents the Word of God. This one represents prayer. The only way that you and I can speak to our Heavenly Father is through the pipeline of prayer. The only way that God speaks to us is through His Word. God brought his word down. Prayers ascend and go up. If either one of these channels are broken, as a Christian, you're going to become stagnated and you're going to become cut off and severed from the grace of God. It is highly important that you learn how to pray and you pray more effectively. So the question that was asked is a good question and we ought to pray without ceasing. And that means I'm praying when things are going well in my life. I'm praying when things are distraught. I'm praying in the morning and the noon and the evening. I'm praying with my family. I'm praying with my wife. And the men are to lead the prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 8, which leads us to another point, Christian. What type of prayer does God hear? I mean, what type of man, just can any man pray? Or is there a certain type of man that God is looking for to pray? Well, something that... You know, brings that to my attention is James chapter five and verse okay. sixteen says the prayer. You know, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so that key word righteous um, and fervent, right? You know, we have to be. We have to make sure that you know righteous. Again, you know, a brief point here is not talking about perfection, but righteous is talking about we are to, you know trying to walk to the commands that God has given to us to the best purpose. Walk in the light, right? But if a man is not living for God, God is not going to systematically hear and answer his prayer. There is a righteousness in our lives that God expects us to have. And without that righteousness, not, God is not going to hear that prayer. Give me the Bible. evening and welcome to What Saith the Scripture. I'm Brant Stubblefield. And I'm Christian Franklin. And tonight we are studying the eight baptisms that are mentioned in the New Testament. Christian, the Bible teaches in Ephesians 4 or 5 that there is one baptism. So how is it that we're going to study about eight different baptisms? 
I think confusion can come because, you know, Paul does talk about that one baptism, but the New Testament does mention and talk about in good detail many other baptisms. And so I'm excited tonight to get to at least get, you know, wet our appetites yes. on what, the, you know, all of these baptisms, what, what they mean, you know, who they were for. It, it's important to get the context correct because I think a lot of people, you know, no ill will can get confused on, you know, which baptism is right sure. for the Christians. So I'm excited tonight too. Before we to begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful this evening to come before your throne. And Father, in the name of Christ our Savior, help us as we study your word this evening that our minds would be directed to the things of Scripture and we would be open and receptive to these truths. Father, help us as we learn about the eight baptisms mentioned in the Scripture. Help us to identify these clearly and help us, Father, to know about that one baptism that you so eloquently mentioned in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Father, help us to be more like your Son, Christ Jesus, and in the end, save us is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. So we have eight baptisms mentioned in the New Testament, and we're going to look at those, and ultimately we're going to see from the words of Paul in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, that there's one baptism. There's only one that remains today, but we want to go through and look at all eight that are mentioned so that we can clearly identify them, that we can become better Bible students, and so that we can understand the entirety of the New Testament. Baptism must be a pretty prevalent subject if there are eight different baptisms mentioned just in the portion of Matthew through Revelation, the New Testament. Amen. And so I was, you know, right off the bat, I was thinking about, uh, you know, Matthew chapter three. Sure. So I'm going to turn there real fast for some of the viewers at home. We're in Matthew chapter three, starting in verse one. It said, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first one Christian is mentioned tonight is what the Bible refers to as the baptism of John. Now first Christian, let's take the time to make sure because the word baptism, you know, words have meaning. Right. And so that's, this word baptism is going to always convey the exact same meaning in all of the passages. Even when it's used figuratively, there'll be a time tonight, baptism of suffering. It'll be used in a figurative sense, but it will still always convey the meaning. What is the meaning of baptism? Just the word itself. Sure, the word itself means immersion. So, uh, you know, we'll be looking at, you know, the different kinds of immersion. You know, there's obviously, you know, water baptism, Ephesians 4, sure. 5. And then there's also the, we'll get to this, the Holy Spirit baptism, which was an outpouring, you know, a, a dry baptism in a sense. But, but it still, always means immersion. The word means immersion. Yeah. And that's why I like working with Christian because he's a good Bible student and he's always going to give that Bible answer. And the word does mean immersion. So as we go through, the reason I say that, don't have in your mind sprinkling or pouring. Keep in your mind that this word means immersion. So the immersion of John or the immersion that was administered by John. And you cited the passage earlier from Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist comes and he is preaching uh, concerning the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. But let's read on down, Christian, and about verse number 6 of Matthew chapter 3. What does the Bible say? In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 6, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So the baptism of John, number one, was linked to a transitionary and preparatory state. Mm. The reason we know that, because the phrase, at hand. The kingdom had not come yet. It was at hand. Within that generation, it was going to come. And so John, according to the great prophets of the Old Testament, like Malachi and Isaiah, that foretold a time in which one would come as a trailblazer, one that would come in a preparatory sense and make the path straight for the coming of the Lord. John did that and he preached repentance and he preached baptism. And we know that because of these verses, but also the Bible teaches Christian concerning this baptism of John, that it was unto the remission of sins. A lot of people don't realize that. It was unto the remission of sins. Would you read Mark chapter one and verse number four? Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So we need to keep that in mind here that the phrase for the remission of sins was connected to John's baptism. And also one of my favorite passages is in John 3 and 23 where the Bible says John preached near Anion, near Salem, wherein there was much water. John preached where there was enough water Think about it, Christian. What was the definition that, that the Bible gives? Full immersion. 
Yes, immersion is the contextual definition in the Bible. And in the Greek, the original language, the Koine Greek in which the Bible was written, that word means immersion. And then we see the context bear that out even remotely. Right. When we go to John 3, 23, he preached specifically in a place, geographically, near in proximity to enough water where the Bible would refer to it as much water. Why? Because he's immersing people. So John's baptism was preparatory, transitionary. It was looking forward to the coming of Christ and the coming, uh, well, I'm sorry, for the coming of Christ's kingdom, excuse me. Yes. And it was where there was much water and it was connected to the remission of sins. But John's baptism was not always going to last. Mm -hmm. And so this baptism, even though, and we're not numbering them in the sense of importance, we're just numbering them so we'll keep an eye on the numbers here. Right. We have to get eight tonight according to what we said. And this is the first one, baptism of John. But you know, there were people in the New Testament Christian that were baptized under this baptism, mm. administered by John, that were baptized into the name of Jesus later. That's right. Can you read Acts chapter 19? Yes. Verses 3 and 4. I'd like for our readers, our readers, our viewers to see that at home. Sure. Acts 19, 3 and 4. And then we're going to have to move on because with eight baptisms, if we don't move quickly, we're going to be here at least an hour and a half. Right. In Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 3, and he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Amen. And I love that passage in John, the third chapter, wherein John said, I must decrease and Christ is going to increase. Amen. And certainly just as the case that John himself said that, so it was that the baptism that he administered also would decrease because it was transitionary in nature. It would fade away. And when the baptism that Christ uh, taught and commanded in the name of Jesus would ultimately, would ultimately be the one that would endure. Amen. Let's look at another baptism tonight, Christian. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And let's look at the baptism that Jesus received. Now, I'm not talking about baptism in the name of Christ. Right. I'm talking about the baptism that Jesus himself received. I love how the text will outline it specifically. Okay. So in Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13, the text says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John. Seventy miles. Seventy miles. I studied that today. Seventy miles approximately. Mm -hmm. To be baptized of him. Now, if he would walk 70 miles to be baptized, he who was sinless. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, John's baptism was for the remission of sins, Mark 1, 4. That's why we have this one here. Many commentators will talk about the seven baptisms. They don't include this one. But folks, Jesus did not receive the baptism of John no. even though John baptized Jesus. This was a unique, one-time, special baptism. It could not have been John's because John's was for the remission of sins. Jesus had no sin. He walks about 70 miles. Keep on reading. Verse 14, But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Wouldn't that be our natural reaction? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, John 1 and 14, ask you to baptize him? You're like, man, I'm a human. I have my own faults. Right. And you, the Messiah, the perfected Son of God, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world, John 1 and 29, mm -hmm. you want me to baptize you? No wonder John had that reluctancy. Sure. In verse 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus' baptism, the one, not that he is going to admit, not the one that he is going to teach about and command, but the one that he received himself was to fulfill all righteousness. Isn't Amen. that beautiful? Amen. Say that, read that one more time. Sure. Verse 15, and Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. All righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. That was in connection with the baptism that Jesus himself received that no one else received. Now read on the text and notice how it pleases his holy father. In verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him, or lighting upon him. Excuse me. Verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is one of the times, there are several times in the New Testament, that God 
God verbally announces his, the fact that he, has, he is pleased with his son. We have the Holy Spirit present. We have Jesus standing in the waters of joy. We have the Father echoing the words from heaven and all three are present. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible teaches us that the baptism that Jesus received was to fulfill all righteousness. Christian, we don't receive the baptism of John today. No. It was transitionary or preparatory. Right. We don't receive the baptism that Jesus received. So even though we've discussed two of these, we still have six to go, and these cannot be the one baptism that remains because these were both limited. Right. Especially Christ, the one he received. And by the way, though, here's a good point. If Jesus walked about 70 miles and felt the obvious need to obey his father exclusively to fulfill all righteousness, and he set that pattern down, he who was without sin was baptized. Can you imagine those of us who have sin resisting the doctrine and the teaching of baptism? I can't imagine that. And, you know, I, I, I hear a lot of individuals say, you know, we need to be baptized like Jesus. But again, you know, we're not sinless. No. You know, before we are, you know, in Christ Jesus and walking in the light, we are, you know, full of sin. You know, we have, we have, you know, we've transgressed God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. So to say that we are to be baptized like Jesus, you know, we obviously have reverence for the text that's given to us, but that's not what we receive today. And so we want to just clarify that for maybe sure. some of the viewers out there, not to Right. Broken pride, but just to have an understanding of what the text. Now we're back is. on another baptism, number three. Again, not in necessarily order of importance. Just we're just going down the list. Baptism of suffering. Mm -hmm. Now again, what does the word baptism mean? It means immersion. It means immersion. So Jesus was immersed. John administered immersion. How do we know? He baptized in the geographical area, any on near Salem, where there was John three twenty three, much water. You're going to see as we study the Bible. The beauty of the harmonization of scriptures. Amen. The Bible never contradicts, no. but it always complements or even supplements. Amen. And we take all the Bible teaching together. No wonder the psalmist, the word of God, the Bible says the sum, S-U-M, the totality of the word of God is truth. And until we understand some of these things, we may lack in some areas. So baptism of suffering, the word, even though it's going to be used, in the word, there's not a literal water baptism here. No. But even when it's used in this way, it's still, gonna, it's still going to con convey the same meaning. It's immersion. Amen. Now notice the passage, Matthew 20, 21 and 22. Baptism of suffering. In Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 21, it says, And he said unto her, What will thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. Verse 22. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, we are able. You know, sometimes we ask for things that we don't really realize the full significance mm -hmm. of. This lady is asking for two, quote, she has a misunderstanding of the nature of the kingdom. Sure. She's thinking a physical kingdom. John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. She asked for a prominent position for her two sons. And he answers that by making a beautiful spiritual application. Do you understand do you understand and are you able to drink the cup and are you able to be baptized in suffering as I'm going to be? Christians have to count the cost, Matthew the 10th chapter, and this baptism or total immersion in the suffering that Jesus himself was going to endure upon that cross is the same suffering that he says that it may be that in my kingdom that your sons have to go through to endure, right? To right. endure those hardships as a good soldier of the cross that Paul would talk about, and to count the cost, deny ourselves, take up the cross, follow him. Revelation 2.10, by the way, is the true meaning. The true meaning is not dying in old age necessarily, no. be faithful to death. What that means is be faithful unto the point that you would give your life, death, martyrdom, for the cause, for the sake of Christianity. The baptism of suffering, Jesus says she didn't understand what she was asking, mm. and here is the teaching, and that means immersion in suffering. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, no, I was just, one thought that came to my mind is talking about you know, the, the cost of discipleship. And I think that's something that we in the church really need to emphasize to, you know, when we're teaching someone that's not in the church is that, you know, it's, it's very rewarding, right, to be faithful until mm -hmm. death, Revelation 2.10. But we also need to consider that we need to kind of, you know, show them that it's going to cost. It's going to cost right. them the world 
to follow the word. And so, Christianity costs something. You're sure. exactly right. And, you know, it was designed to cost us something. Mm. We live in a day and an age when most of us have had little to no persecution. And so in our, com- in our comfort of Christianity, many times we have foregone uh, those levels of sacrifices. Mm. And it has, in a sense, caused us to look at Christianity in a cheapened mm. sense. Right. So we need to make sure that we understand the value. And you always associate the value of something with the cost. Amen. What is the cost of the church of Christ? The blood of Jesus, Acts 20 and 28. What is the value of your soul? It cost Jesus his blood to redeem you back, buy you back the second time. He created you the first time, God the Holy Father, the Son, the Spirit. They were all involved in the creation process, right? They brought us into existence the first time. In sin, we severed that fellowship, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Jesus bought us back a second time, Ephesians 1, 7, the riches of his grace, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption of our sins. And so the beauty of that is our soul is valuable because it cost Jesus his blood, his life. The Amen. church and our souls are very valuable commodities and we ought not to look at either of those in a less, in a less than the blood of Jesus value. Amen. Christian, do you have 1 Corinthians 10, yeah. 1 and 2? Now we're going to look at baptism number 4. And this one is in reference unto Moses. Now we know many times the Apostle Paul would talk about Romans 15, 4, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, that the things written aforetime were written for our ensamples, Mm. for our binding examples of Old Testament truths that would relate a particular point that would therefore assist us with patience and comfort that we in turn might have hope of living the Christian life. And one of the great episodes of the Old Testament was, was God's deliverance of Israel, right? And right. so, Christian, tell us about that Old Testament episode from the words of the Apostle Paul. Sure. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1, says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. In verse 2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And just as the Israelites were rescued and delivered... Right? They were surrounded. They were immersed. They were surrounded, delivered by the power of God. Baptism unto Moses, likened unto us today, we have been delivered from sin. Right? Amen. We've been rescued from the power of darkness, Colossians chapter 1, 13, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. How is that done? Well, we talked about that before. Right? We've talked about that. At the cross, there was a death, the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was placed, his physical, literal body was placed in a borrowed new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the fulfillment of prophecy from the book of Isaiah that he would make his grave, right, Right. with the rich and so forth. And from that grave, he made a triumphant, miraculous bodily resurrection. There was a change in in the state of Christ. Well, he who had no sin died, was buried, and he arose into a glorious changed state, a marvelous, marvelous resurrection. We, in turn, die to our sin. We're buried in the, in the watery grave of baptism, contacting, contacting the provisions that Christ thereby made for us. And when we arise, we arise to walk in a changed state. You can't be added to the kingdom of the church until you've been changed you're not going to come into the kingdom defiled. You're going to come in clean. How are you clean? By the blood of the Lamb, 1 Peter 1 and 19. And so that's why when Paul talks about in Corinthians chapter 10, this Old Testament example, pretty interesting to me, Christian, because we read back in prior chapters, there were things that the Corinthian members were doing that were not acceptable to God. Mm. And he's reminding, listen, even, those, even though those people had been rescued, the Israelites, the people of God, Under the baptism of Moses, they were rescued from Egyptian slavery and bondage. Many of them later on, what happened? Started falling away. They started falling away. The Bible is its own best commentary. The book of Hebrews says, many of them died for the sin of unbelief. Mm. Many people today, look look again, the necessity issue here. If they were not baptized into Moses, they didn't make it across that place, right? No. You had to be baptized into Moses to make it to be delivered. Today, we have to be baptized into Christ Jesus to be delivered from our sin, Colossians 1, 13, Romans 6, 4, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But then, even then, even after we're baptized, we need to be careful that we, like our old Israelite ancestors, don't fall back into sin. Paul talked about the idolatrous worship and the various things that these 
Christians were doing. So I thought that is a marvelous comparison there. And we need to preach more about that passage later on probably. Sure, yeah, I'd love to. Christian, here's one. Let's look at uh, the baptism of fire. Matthew mm. chapter 3. Now this one can be tricky. Sure. And it's tricky in a sense for a lot of people because two baptisms are mentioned very closely connected in the text. Mm. So some people believe that Holy Ghost baptism and fire baptism are the same baptism. Mm. But the reality is they're two separate baptisms and truth shall be told. Sure. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now John is speaking. Right. And John says, I baptize you with water. Well, that's true. Because what did John 3.23 say? He preached near Antioch near Salem. Why? Because there was water. But how much water? Much, much water. Why much? Because the word baptism means, in the Koine Greek, and in context, immediate and remote, what does it always mean? Immersion. Immersion. So John is going to immerse people in an area he's going to preach where there's much water so that after he preaches and during his preaching, when people ask to be baptized from the teaching that he has done, he has an ability to do what he's preaching about. Amen. By the way, that's why when we preach, what do we have handy? Much water. Right. There's a baptistry. And when we preach and call people call people to follow the teachings of God, we have near in proximity a pool of water ready to go for people to follow the teachings of God. So here is John in Matthew chapter 3, 11 and 12. I baptize you with water unto repentance. Mark 1, 4, John 3, 23, Matthew 3, 1, 2. But he who comes after me, speaking about Jesus, what's he going to do? He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost okay. and with fire. And I suppose I got these out of order here, sure. but let me write them both down. Five and six, baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, or the text says Holy Ghost and fire. Now, these are not the same. In fact, if you look in the context of this passage, we have two different points being illustrated. And what we know here on, go on down and read the next verse sure. concerning the fire. In verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, mm -hmm. and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat unto the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable. I think that word, I, I need to look it up. Somebody at home can look it up and let me know. But I believe, if memory serves me correctly, that comes from the, that word is where we get our word asbestos. Mm. You know, asbestos suit. It, it, it's resistant. Unquenchable. In other words, there's going to be a fire at the end that's going to purge, that's going to, to destroy, not annihilate, but bring ruin. The word destroy, they're being, bring ruin or loss to a soul. That fire is likened unto a sense of being unquenchable. Mm. There's an eternal ruin. Not a, and then you're gone, no. but a fire that's not able to be quenched or put out. And so that's where we get our word, I believe, asbestos. Somebody can check me out on that. But here we have the word fire, and it's unquenchable. Folks, this is Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. The lake of fire which were cast into who? Those is not written in the Lamb's book of life. This is in reference to hell eternal. Mm. This is something serious. Right. We don't want a part of this. And what does that word mean, baptism? It means immersion. So that means in hell people are going to be completely overwhelmed, immersed, not sprinkled, immersed in an ongoing, eternal, unquenchable fire. We want to avoid the baptism of fire. Amen. I want to just, avoid this one. I was just thinking Matthew 25, 41. Read know, it. The, the everlasting fire says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Everlasting, unquenchable. It's a fire that's related to the word baptism, which means immersion. Mm -hmm. This is eternal. We don't want to go there. We no. want to avoid this one. This is the one on the list um, that we absolutely want to avoid. Right. And when Paul said one baptism, he's not saying this one doesn't exist. But this one is not an essential to the Christian foundation of right. Ephesians 4. This one, this one is the punishment of all of those who that God in the text says shall be punished. Amen. Let's go on to the next one though, Christian. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Can you quote that verse or read it for us, please? Well, I want to go to Acts chapter, I believe... Well, there's Luke chapter 24, verse 40, 49. Okay. Excuse me. Luke 24, 49. There's also uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. So I'll start in Luke 24. Okay. 
Luke 24, if you're listening at home while Christian's turning over there, this is one of several places in the New Testament where in reference to the Great Commission, Jesus is instructing the men that are going to become official ambassadors for the upcoming kingdom and church. He is instructing them on what's going to occur. Then in Acts, the second chapter, the church is going to begin, or the kingdom. And so we're going to have the commission, the great charge, and then we're going to have uh, immediately preceding the kingdom. These should match accordingly to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24, and verse 49, mm -hmm. the Bible says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He's speaking to the apostles, tarry ye in Jerusalem. Number one, and I think we've stated this on a previous broadcast, sure. but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is unique mm. in that it was not commanded. No. Baptism of John was commanded. Baptism uh, later on that we're going to get to in the name of Christ right. is commanded, yeah. Acts 10 and 48. Amen. But this baptism was not a command, folks. It was a promise to the royal ambassadors, the apostles, and they were to tarry in Jerusalem to wait, and there would be a significant amount of overwhelming power. Why overwhelming, Christian? Because the word means what? The immersion. Immersion. Fully immersed. So they were immersed in the Holy Spirit, in the Spirit's influence. Now let's read over to Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Yeah. Note, yes, that's right. And by the way, notice that the word command there was not in reference to the baptism. The word command was in the idea of waiting in Jerusalem, right. tarrying there, because the promise would not be given until the Father's due time, because the promise of the Holy Spirit baptism was going to be in the timetable and the chronological development and the fulfillment of all of the biblical prophecy in the coming and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom of which Jesus would reign over. Very important. It reminds me of Mark 9 and 1 mm. where the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, some of you standing here, that you shall not taste of death till you see the kingdom of God come with what? Come with power. power. Yeah. Luke 24, 49, power. Acts 1, 4 and 5, power. Mark 9 and 1, power. Why? Because there's going to be a baptism, meaning the word immersion, and overwhelming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. And as soon as that occurs, now they've already been qualified as far as their eyewitness test. You know, they, they have been right. eyewitnesses of the life of Christ, right. John and so forth. Now they've been endued with power from on high. Now they're ready. Amen. Now they're ready to take upon the world's greatest mission effort, taking the whole gospel to the whole world, and they accomplished it according to Colossians chapter 1, in their lifetime. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Christian, can we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost today? Like you said, it's not commanded. It was an outpouring. It was a, for a specific audience, too. We know that uh, we have the apostles in Acts, right? And then we also, mm -hmm. later on in Acts chapter 10, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit onto the Gentiles. And so <laughs> what, what I love about this baptism, and we don't have to get too much into detail, but what I love about it is that it, it's so unique because it was an outpouring yes. upon high. It was a what you like to call a dry baptism, something that's not, you know, they're, they're being immersed, sure. but not in water, it's being immersed in power. And so that's what, you know, they can get confusing, I understand. So it, it, it takes a lot of study to understand, you know, the Holy Ghost baptism is not for us as no. Christians today. And one of the reasons we know that is because Holy Ghost baptism was for the apostles in the church's infant stage to work grand and marvelous miracles to do two important things. To prove the identity of the spokesman that God had authored the apostles to carry out his mission. Right. They had his stamp of approval. And secondly, to confirm the word, Mark chapter 16, verse number 20, they're going to go everywhere, Great Commission, Mark's account, they're going to go everywhere preaching the word, God confirming the word with signs, miracles, that is, following. Amen. The Bible's beautiful. And now we come to number seven, probably the most hotly discussed or debated one by commentaries. And I'll be honest with you, number seven is a difficult text. If any preacher tells you it's not, I think he would be somewhat uh, hard to believe because number seven is a difficult text. But here's what I was always trained by older preachers to do, Christian, when you come to a difficult text. Number one, 
do not draw out anything out of the text that would fly against basic, easier to understand passages elsewhere in the New Testament. Sure. Number two, we're not going to create a doctrine in a difficult text that is not substantiated other places. So, you know, some fly off the wall interpretation that would confuse and confound rather than to bring clarity. And because we know, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. In all the churches. Amen. So we want to look at this passage and we're going to start by answering in the negative what I absolutely know it is not. So read the passage, please. Sure. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they, de oh, why are they the baptized for the dead? Yeah. Notice the pronouns here. Not we, they, those. Some translations right. will say those. So there are some religious groups, basically Mormons, who teach that the, a proxy baptism. Let's, let's pretend that that I am already passed away. I'm deceased. Now, death is the separation of body, soul, spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, at death, we have vacated this fleshly body. The spirit goes back to God. The soul awaits judgment. And the body goes back to ground and from where it came. Sure. Okay, so at death, some would say at death that if I've never become a Christian, if I was never baptized, I didn't live properly, I died a heathen that one who was righteous could come along and you could be baptized in proxy. You could be baptized for the benefit of one who has already passed. Now, I know that interpretation can't be right. And it looks like from, you could see though where somebody from a shallow interpretation could take verse 29 and say, well, baptized for the dead. So Christians baptized for Brant because Brant's dead. You could see where they could reason that. Right. But... When we study this, I know that can't be the case because of too many clear-cut passages. For example, no word to write. We'll just talk. Need to get two boards, Christian, and angle them. <laughs> but think about this passage. Every man shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and number 10. Amen. Listen how easy this passage is. It's not a difficult passage. It's clear and it's cut. Every man shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer of the things done in the body. And listen to that phrase, in the body. Now, when, if I'm passed away, I'm not in the body. So I'm judged according to the things I've done in the body. Right now, while I have breath, while I'm alive, and notice this, good and bad. Proxy baptism only allows people to go back and to reach for the good, mm. not the bad. You notice how humans are? We, we believe, based upon that past, some people believe on that past, they can go back and, and bring, bring the person that's a heathen back to goodness by a proxy baptism. But what about the bad? So there's many passages, Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Those ladies that did not have oil in their lamps, what happened? There was no, there was no ability. Do you have any other thoughts or passages? Well, you know, I was thinking, yeah, sorry, I was kind of... Yeah, uh, I know you were thinking. So but yeah, you know, I mean, why... It's almost like, and this is just a, a thought of mine, but, you know, having the righteousness of someone else, you know, if someone has been following the divine commands of God being a righteous person, you know, 1 Peter 3 and 12, sure. James 5, 16, and then I, you know, I'm living how I want, I'm living in the world, I'm not living as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1, and then I, you know, can just be baptized into someone else's, you know, but good deeds, and it doesn't it doesn't match up with what Scripture is telling us that Amen. each individual should be. We're going to be accountable for our own actions, good and bad, and it kind of defeats the purpose of the blood of Christ. You know, for all men. I mean, we have that gift that's access. We have to access that gift, obviously, but that, it defeats the purpose. Uh, and so, I it's like you know, I can just do whatever I want because you know, you lived a good Christian life, but I can live how I want, just be baptized into your, your death. I, it doesn't. I'm not being baptized yes. into you. You know, we're being baptized into Christ. And so that... And you know, I thought about just now, I know it's in Luke 16, it's down about yeah. verse 26, but the Bible refers to the great gulf fixed. Mm. That's yeah. what's stated in the King James. The great gulf that is fixed. So remember the episode uh, of the rich man and Lazarus. Yes. And there was a gulf that was fixed. That is, there is a wall seemingly that is 
figuratively mentioning that the whole point of it is there is a chasm that you're unable to cross over. So we're not having baptism for anyone that's passed away in proxy. We're not going to set aside clear-cut passage like 2 Corinthians 5.10, Luke 16, Hebrews 9.27. It's appointed once man to die and after this cometh the judgment. We're not going to go to 1 Corinthians 15.29. Truly, truly, I'll admit, a difficult passage. Sure. But we're not going to pull away some half, half dangerous ideology and false teaching and ride that horse. That, that's just not going to happen. So part of our job as a teacher is to always remind ourselves we must stay within what the Bible teaches clearly Amen. and we must only teach those things that we're assured of. Amen. And I am assured that baptism for the dead here is not a proxy baptism. Amen. There's basically, there's many, but I would say two main thoughts concerning baptism these scriptures. One is supposedly there was a sect at that time. I've done some study. I believe it's Tertullian that brought this up mm -hmm. in some extra biblical sources. And you have to be careful because right. anything extra biblical is just that. It's not inspired. But the best we can see is there, there are recordings of people who had basically denied the resurrection. And we know that. Now think about the placement in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. What is under discussion in this chapter? Let's get the context. The resurrection. Sure. Yep. Right? The power of the resurrection and even more personally, the resurrection of Christ himself. Yes. Many groups like the Sadducees in the, in the early uh, New Testament days denied, denied angels and the resurrection itself. So some contend that there was a segment of people who were denying the bodily, literal resurrection of Jesus and even the bodily resurrection of anybody. Right. And so the point was, was look, if, if you're being baptized... That is countless if you don't hold to the doctrine of the resurrection. That's what some believe. Others would believe this is a reference to saints uh, that had died before. But, but either way, the whole point is this. It's a difficult passage, and we will not make a new doctrine from a difficult passage. But we know, we absolutely know, that it's not a baptism of some, quote, proxy. But Christian, I've been excited tonight because... It never gets old. No, it does not. I started preaching some, just a little bit at about 15. Quite a bit at 17. And I'm 40. That means that's about 23, 25 years. Christian's been preaching three or four years already. Now look, I don't care if I'm 100 years old, if I can still preach. I could never, never speak about this subject that I would not be passionate. Because this subject is one of salvation. We are now looking at the one baptism mentioned in Ephesians 4 or 5. Amen. Now, this baptism is more important than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's not transitionary or temporary like John's baptism. Right. It's not a... It's not confined... To a difficult text like 1 Corinthians 15 29. This baptism is substantiated clearly throughout all the New Testament. And it is the one that Paul says, it is the one that indisputable baptism that's ranked among the seven indisputable ones that foundation Christians tell us about this one baptism. Well, first off, we know that it's commanded. Acts 2.38. Okay. Acts 2.38. Christian says, let's start off and get it right, that it is not a promise. And now, by the way, it has promise. Sure. But it is not a promise, although it contains a promise, remission of sins, but it is, Christian says, commanded. Acts 2 and 38. How do you know it's commanded from this text? Well, we know that, uh, you know, and Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so we know that Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom, Matthew 16, 19. Mm -hmm. So what were those keys? It was keys to get it, you know, to get into the kingdom, to get into the church. Uh, Colossians 1, 13, we like being translated into the kingdom to get into the body. And so we know that to get into that kingdom, we have to do what is commanded. And we know that's Acts 2, 38. Right. Baptism. And the way it's spoken, right? The fact that an apostle is speaking. It's terms, like you mentioned, of entrance into the kingdom. Right. And then I love Acts 10 and 48. And by mm -hmm. the way, folks, isn't this interesting? 
On this day, we have the gospel first going to the house of Israel, Amen. the Jewish people. And then later on, we're going to have that same one baptism, right, in the name of Jesus, is going to go to the house of Cornelius to represent the first and the beginnings of the conversions of the Gentiles. Amen. Now, so if it's the same baptism, then it's going to be like in all ways. So number one, Christian says it's commanded. And that's right, because Acts 10 and 48 says what? And they? You know, commanded to be baptized. So. They were commanded to be baptized. We know it's a water baptism. Yes. How do we know that? Because Acts 10 says, how can we forbid water that these may be baptized? Same baptism. The Jews are going to receive that the Gentiles are going to receive. By the way, both Acts 2.38 and Acts 10.48 says this baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ. And that means, that means, folks, his divine authority. Christian, read Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Again, this is the Great Commission recorded by Matthew. Matthew's account of the gospel. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So this one baptism is commanded. It's in water. By the way, what does the definition still mean? It means immersion. So it means if you're going to have enough water, just like John did, John 3, 23, to fully immerse someone, that corresponds to the full burial of Jesus. It's going to be in the name of Jesus, which was already told in Matthew 28, that it was going to be by his divine authority, of which Jesus had spoken of himself, all authority has been granted. Yes. All authority is vested in Christ Jesus. You know, if you have a 401k, you can be vested. All authority was vested completely in Christ Jesus. And therefore, when he summoned and gave a commandment and a charge and a challenge to the apostles, his royal ambassadors, to go out into the world, he did not leave them helpless. He gave them power from on high. A promise, Luke 24, 49, right? And a promise that was received in Acts, or told about in Acts 1, 4, and 5, and received in Acts 2, 1 through 4. And these apostles, beginning in Jerusalem, Peter speaking, is going to command water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Christian, what's it for? What's the purpose of this baptism? This is the best part. For the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. I'm reminded of what the old patriarch David, King David said way, way back. Remember not the sins of my youth. Mm. Think about all of the crimson blood that had stained the altars of the Old Testament. Think about all of the shadows and the typology that were, that were typified in the Old Testament. All of the blood that was shed looking forward to the day in which Jesus would come and all the blood of bulls and goats would fade and be taken away. Hebrews 10 and 4. And you know what? Today, that prayer is fully fulfilled in Christ. Remember not the sins of my youth. God does not remember in any sense the sins of our youth when we obey the gospel. Why? Because we are given as a promise to this command. We have a command to obey and there's a promise given. The promise Amen. is we're going to receive remission. Not remembrance, remission. God chooses not to remember. That means he holds us not accountable to our previous sins. We may have earthly consequences, but God is not going to spiritually hold us responsible. He's not going to pour out his wrath upon us because he's not going to remember our sins. He's going to remember his son's blood and body. He's going to give us, because of his son's unspeakable gift, 2 Corinthians 9 and 15, he's going to give us freely the remission of sins when we, by faith, obey this command. Amen. And when we obey this command, we receive this promise. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. That's the gospel. The gospel has facts to be believed, commands to be obeyed, promises to be received, and warnings to be heeded. And the baptism of fire is a warning that we stated earlier that we don't want to receive. No. Christian, would you have any more thoughts tonight as we get close to closing? You know, I was thinking, you know, talking about the Old Testament examples of how sin was 
you know, purified and all the animal sacrifices and, and so much, it, it felt like so much work had to be done. But you know, it was easy, you know, I shouldn't say easy in a way, but it's, 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 it's simple to be physically baptized in the water. Obviously we must believe, right? Right. But, but God is, you know, through his son, without that blood, there'd be no remission of sins, Hebrews 9 verse 22. But through his son, you know, we have that access to that gift of salvation and, and by usually a, a pretty simple mean just to be baptized you know into water and so water is accessible to all parts of the world right. water is accessible to the poorest of people right mm -hmm. water is something that is universally made available so therefore salvation in god's grace to me is vividly portrayed in sure. the universal availability of that water number two it is also the case that as you mentioned Baptism is not some meritorious action no. as some want to pin it out to be or point it out to be because God has not asked us to climb Mount Everest. I don't know that some people could do that. That's a meritorious action. That's an accomplishment. Baptism actually is passive. It's a work of God. Right. Colossians 2.12. Yeah. God is operating, right? But it's passive. I've always used this illustration and I think it's worth repeating. Sure. If I'm baptizing Christian. I am doing the work. I am lowering him down and I am raising him up. He is submitting and trusting in me to do for him. You know, God doesn't tell you to baptize yourself. No. God says that we're to go out, teach people, baptize them, and then teach them all things whatsoever he's commanded. So if I were to baptize Christian, I'm doing the work. He is submitting. Now think about that spiritually. He is in the passive. God is in the operation room. Amen. God is the one working. Christian is submitting. He comes to obey the command of God with full faith. And that's why Colossians 2.12 says, faith in the operation of God. So when we by faith obey the command of God, we receive the promise of God. Folks, God is good. God is in the saving business. The word gospel means good news, good tidings. And tonight we hope and pray that someone Someone out on the broadcast is thinking about the one baptism. Amen. Not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No. That was to the apostles, Acts 1, 4, and 5, Luke 24, 44 through 49. Not the baptism uh, for the dead, a difficult text, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Not the baptism of John that was temporary, Matthew 3, 1 and 2. But the baptism that Paul says, that one baptism, those indisputable seven essentials. That one baptism has the promise of remission of sins, not the remembrance of those sins. And someday, Christian, I don't know how long it's going to be, but someday we're going to die. Mm. And I think every person watching this evening ought to think about the fact that we are going to die. Unless the Lord comes again in the clouds of glory during our life, we are all going to walk down the halls of death. There's going to come a time in which our physical life will expire. No matter if we die tragically in our youth, if we fall prey to cancer, or we live to be a ripe old age and, and rocking in a wooden rocking chair, pass away quietly, we're all going to die. That's inevitable, universal, and inescapable. Here's the question. Are we prepared? Preparation begins in no other place than the remission of of sins, the precious blood of Jesus from the grace of our living God has supplied man with everything he needs to obey the gospel. Friend, won't you think about it? Won't you tonight call us at 405-756-0880, private message us however you can and let us study with you about becoming a Christian. Amen. And until next time, Christian, everybody ought to be asking that same question. What, what saith the, the scripture? scripture.